Hey everyone, welcome to Forum, Occupy Forum. Um, we have with us tonight uh, Cecile Pineda to speak about her book, um, Devil's Tango, How I Learned the Fukushima Step-by-Step, -step, and other things. Um, she has just completed a tour of the Northeast, a thousand miles, um, in, in 15 different appearances in nine days and visited four troubled reactor communities. So then at the end, we'll have a question and answer session. Thanks a lot. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for turning out. Uh, we're a small group, so it would be really nice to get up tight, if you like. So thank you so much uh, for being here, and thank you, Answer, for uh, keeping us out of the rain, keeping our powder dry. Uh, we're very appreciative of all of that, yeah. Um, so tonight I want to share uh, some observations with you. Uh, and I want to put what I'm going to be saying, hi, come on in, sit down, <laughs> you're welcome. I want to sort of put some of what I'm going to be talking about in uh, perspective. Uh, because uh, what I hope tonight uh, to be able to do with us, because in a sense this is going to be something of a workshop, um, is to stress that this issue of what's going on in Fukushima is planetary <coughs> in scope. And that we are beyond the place where available technology can address what is ongoing and what probably is going to be ongoing for many, many years, decades. Uh, right now, people are using the figure 40 years. Well, you know what? Uh, that's a fairy tale. Uh, this is going to be with us, certainly within our lifetimes. Unfortunately, our children's lifetimes and our grandchildren's lifetimes as well. The other point that I want to stress, and I'm sure that this is not unknown to you, is that the nuclear industry has two faces. The first face is nuclear energy. We have 104 nuclear plants operating in this country. Of those 104, 23 are GE Mark I boiling water reactors. That just happens to be the same model reactor that failed at Fukushima. Why did it fail? It did not fail because of a tsunami. The press wants you to imagine that the tsunami was the precipitating cause. But before the tsunami hit, radiation warnings went off at Fukushima because what we have seen is containment failure. And I want to stress that those reactors <coughs> were sold by General Electric, one of our favorite corporations, worldwide, knowing they were defective, knowing that they would have a 90% probability of failure on stress, that they would have containment failure. And the proof of that is that three engineers on the design team quit rather than sign off. And one of them is Dale Breidenbaugh. I heard him speak um, most recently in Santa Clara, in Santa Cruz. And um, he is the one that, that went on record saying that the GE Mark I boiling water reactor was 10 pounds of energy in a five pound sack. So these, these are factoids, but what I 
hope to accomplish with us tonight is to put all of those sound bites together in a picture so that what emerges is very clear to you and to me. Um, because the nuclear industry has two faces. The energy face and the war making face. If you have been out in the streets, as I know we, many of us have been for years and years, asking for peace, demanding peace. And we have seen war after war after war, and there is no peace. But the nuclear industry is inextricably linked to the weapons industry on any one of a number of levels this whole picture of the way the nuclear cycle the way it works is extremely complex but in the most obvious way in order to obtain fuel for nuclear plants uranium-235 needs to be enriched in the enrichment process the byproduct is uranium-238 uranium-238 is called by the publicity folks oops depleted uranium depleted uranium there is nothing depleted about depleted uranium in fact it is infinitely more lethal than just ordinary radiation it has a half-life of 4.5 billion years and I'm sure that the many of you know this, but I'll just review it. Uh, DU has been used in Kosovo. It has been used in Iraq. There's no reason to suppose that it hasn't been used in Afghanistan. It's been used in Libya, been used in Yemen, and most probably in Pakistan and probably in Somalia. Now, just, and this is a sidebar, there are many, in this subject, there are many, many sidebars. It's a very complex bunch of information to master. But there have been studies by Iraqi physicians because what they began to see was not not birth defects, we're not talking about ADD now. What I'm talking about is birth deformities. And these are births that are extremely challenged births. These are almost what we might call the products of conception. These are children born, for example, with two heads, or no head at all, or blind, or deaf or without faces, with just openings. Um, there are children born, for example, with their internal organs on the outside, or with horrific spinal deformities. And these began to appear uh, after Gulf One. You remember Gulf One? And you remember the um, strafing of the retreating Iraqi army. So you know uh, that a great deal of depleted uranium was used. Now, why was it used? It was used because it's pyrophoric, which simply means that when you tip ordnance with it, and we're talking about shells, but you know, it could be much larger. Bunker busters are, uh, in fact, uh, tipped with uh, depleted uranium. Uh, and what it does is it gives, it enhances its penetrative qualities so that on impact it explodes and the product of that explosion is nanoparticles, not just dust, but nanoparticles. So the residue operates like a gas and as a result the soils of Iraq are now contaminated for all eternity. For all 
eternity. This is our planet. They are our people. They are us. And we are them. And I want to just say at this point in parentheses that when I talk about this subject very often, I notice that the local reaction I get from our country folk, our countrymen, our country women, as well as it's safe to eat. And I don't hear anything about has it been safe for Iraqis to live? And now I'm noticing that with Sandy, at Hurricane Sandy, I heard one person of all the interviewees that you hear on the media, only one person said, this must be like it is, or like it was in Iraq, where there was no infrastructure. We don't have water, we don't have food. We don't have heat, we have no power. Well, Iraq's been living like that for 10 years. But one person that I heard, now there may be more, but primarily the reaction is, we don't have any water. It's our right, it's our privilege. We don't have any power. We don't have any food. We don't have any. And I look at that and I think about what that must mean. And what that must mean is that there isn't yet the kind of consciousness that we're all one flesh. And in fact, a very useful way of looking at life, human life if you like, is, because there's so many of us now, right? Six, six billion. We have become an organism on this planet. And we are functioning. If you take a very long view, we are functioning like an organism. And we are living in a time where there are tremendous population stresses on this planet because this planet's systems can't support six billion people living as we have lived, particularly in this country. So all of these issues are connected to the nuclear picture. And global warming is one as we saw with Sandy, because I don't know what it takes to wake up people, and I think there are going to be people that are going to forget about Sandy, not people in Staten Island, they'll remember. But, you know, it'll be yesterday's news. I really think it's going to be buried again. Uh, and politicians certainly are not going to address it. So, what we saw with Sandy is that we have one reactor in Forked River, New Jersey, which just happens to be a GE Mark I boiling water reactor. This is the technology that we use to boil water. That's what we're doing, we're boiling water and risking the life of our planet. But Oyster Creek is the name of this plant. And Oyster Creek uh, was not shut down nor was Indian Point. Indian Point, by the way, if Indian Point goes, uh, and it's another GE Mark I boiling water reactor, is that right? Yes, it is. And Pilgrim also uh, uh, on Cape Cod. Uh, there are GE Mark I's. Um, if Indian Point goes, that's 35 million people. You are not going to evacuate 35 million people. And I'll talk about evacuation because that's another little piece of this immense puzzle. But Oyster Creek is uh, on, the, on the coast of New Jersey and um, it was at risk of failure. Why? Because the water was rising and the limit was seven feet. All right? And in the meantime, its power systems, internal power systems, had failed. And we know that because its warning system failed. There was no way, if there had been an accident, of alerting people that there had been an accident. So 
its internal power had failed. Its external power had failed. And they were depending on an internal fire suppression system in case there was a problem. Now, the water was at six and a half feet. And then guess what? It did not obey. It just kept rising. And it rose over the level where the plant essentially would have had a catastrophic accident. Probably because of Fukushima, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, they delayed, but eventually they kind of had a get together <laughs> and they decided to uh, initiate an inquiry into uh, what happened at Fukushima. And eventually they published a document, and you can see it on their website, Lessons Learned from Fukushima. And perhaps because of that, Exelon Corporation, which by the way is uh, Mr. Obama's uh, favorite energy company, um, because probably of that report, Exelon saw fit just in case to get an emergency backup system. Now that's probably, and I'm not sure, but it's probably either gasoline or diesel operated. And if I know based on what's happening at Fukushima, uh, probably mounted on a truck. That's what saved the citizens of New Jersey. Okay? That system mounted on a truck. So that's just one really small picture of what's going on. But now, I want to just address the question of Fukushima. Uh, when Fukushima happened, uh, I don't know how you felt. And, and I don't know if you remember physically where you were the day that uh, the accident happened. Um, it's, for me, it's kind of like, where were you when JFK was shot? I remember. Why? Because it was very clear to me that this was planetary in scale, that it would affect our air, our water, our food, and our soils. And initially, uh, there were uh, resources available on the internet where you could see uh, readings uh, of, of soil and water and food contamination and so forth. Uh, and, and one of them, by the way, this is just a sidebar, but uh, it was um, initiated by the Department of Nuclear Engineering at the University of California to think maybe they might have a conflict of interest there. Anyway, at first they gave us readings, and yes, there were there were traces of fallout. Uh, it hit the west coast about five or six days after the explosions, and it continued to move across the country. In fact, now as I speak, there are hot spots in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, okay, that that are nearly a hundred counts per minute. Uh, just uh, thirty would would be, I think, normal background. So this gives you an idea. Um, it's, it's blanketed the entire northern hemisphere. And now, despite people saying that, oh, well, so long, you guys, we're out of here, we're going to move to the southern hemisphere, uh, it's in the southern hemisphere as well. Um, and of course, it has contaminated the oceans because gallons and gallons of contaminated water uh, were dumped into the Pacific by TEPCO. So let me just tell you what's going on uh, at present in Fukushima. You probably know that there are three meltdowns. Uh, you probably know that radiation levels are extremely high, and at least one of these uh, one of these uh, damaged plants destroyed. They're they're not they're not damaged. They're destroyed. Um, unit four is a particular concern because unit four uh, structurally has been compromised, and it has been shored up somewhat. Uh, amateurishly um, to prevent it from uh, essentially subsiding 
but there are conflicting reports. So if you talk to an engineer, a Japanese engineer, he'll tell you it can't sink, okay, because it's supported by three piers that are driven way deep into bedrock, okay, so it can't sink. But there's another authority who happens to be um, a former ambassador to Switzerland, Japanese ambassador to Switzerland, whose name is Murata, and according to Murata, yes, it is sinking, but not uniformly. So it's a kind of a, a little bit sagging. So it is very hard to know without going there, and I don't think any of us are proposing a trip uh, right now. Um, but I can tell you this, that TEPCO has refused to have external help from any source. Uh, I think for one reason, they don't want people to know how really terrible the situation is. How really beyond our available te technological expertise the magnitude of this accident is. They don't want that to come out. Uh, so when workers uh, appear at the plant and are hired, they sign a paper saying that, of course, they will not divulge. But there have been whistleblowers, so we do know something about what's going on. Uh, one of the first whistleblowers, and uh, he's in this book, uh, he's a, a journalist, he actually uh, put on the hazmat suit and he hired out for six uh, weeks and he had a hidden camera in his wristwatch. So he documented a lot of what he saw. What he said says is that at least 10% of the people working at, you know, at, at, uh, at Fukushima Daiichi are Yakuza affiliated. That's the Japanese mafia. And the way it works is that if you gamble, and a lot of people, a lot of Asians really like to gamble, um, I guess some of us do too, um, if you gamble and you owe money to the Yakuza, uh, you know, they're going to come get you. And so, uh, they have a hold over you, and they say, well, if you don't want to be rubbed out, you go to work at Fukushima. So a lot of people are Yakuza affiliated, and additionally, when people reach their uh, contamination levels where they can't work there anymore, and again, they fumble and fool around with the dosimeters, but when they reach a level where they basically have to be cashiered, and they are hiring workers all over the world. There are ads all over the world for offering very high salaries to people who, to come and work there. Now I'm told that many of the people that come and work there are, uh, first of all, mental patients. Uh, they are disabled. Uh, they are teenagers. I mean, would we want to send our teenagers there? I don't think so. Uh, so that's what's happening. And, as you pointed out, there are, uh, eight echelons, or seven or eight echelons of contractors. And on the way down, every one of those echelons takes a cut. So the worker who's, a, who's doing the really dirty work at the bottom, basically uh, receives maybe a hundred dollars a day, if he's lucky, for this work. And there is a subsidy for people who are doing this very dangerous work, and the contractors have seen fit to help themselves to it. So these poor blokes who are at the bottom of the pyramid basically are doing this terribly dangerous work. They are not educated in terms of knowing what to do with a plant and how to operate a nuclear plant. They don't know the very basics. So for example, I'm just going to give you a few factoids. They installed uh, pretty much throughout the system PVC. Uh, for those of you who know, that's plastic pipe. And uh, it has a nasty habit of cracking uh, when it freezes. Now, the temperatures at Fukushima, despite global warming, Japan gets very, very cold in the winter, terribly cold. So there's a risk of these pipes fracturing. And they're uh, actually installed in, in different areas, uh, in different parts of the, of the plant, including the drainage ditches. That's number one. Number two, I can tell you, because I've seen pictures, um, they're, they're, they're talking about building a seawall uh, to keep uh, future tsunamis out. Uh, well, uh, just a little background, again, a little sidebar about, about tsunamis. It appears that in Japan, you know, Japan has a very long and ancient history. And until about 100 years ago, it was recycling everything. 
it, it had a system where everything was recycled. And then the West arrived with its improvements and its progress. But essentially, um, wh what we need to know is that um, Fukushima originally it was uh, designed to occupy a site that was a hundred feet, a hundred feet above the sea level. And before it was built, they shaped the hill so that it was 30 feet. So that's the first factoid. The second thing about uh, that area of Japan is that there are stone, um, they're like stills or like, uh, we would call them tombstones in a sense, that's what they look like. And they recorded the last monster tsunamis for the last thousand years. And it was known by local people that this was an area that was vulnerable, okay. Now, uh, TEPCO is talking about building a seawall to keep the next one out. And so what, what do they have? And I've seen this, you know, I've seen a picture of this. It's garbage bags. It appears to be plastic bags filled with stuff. It looks basically like a waste disposal site. And there are just several levels of garbage bags. Well, you know what water's going to do. And then pull them all out, right? So this just gives you an idea of what's going on. Now, what the danger is, is that, and I'm really sorry to share this with you, but... <laughs> We are living in a completely altered existential moment because at any time, Unit 4 can, can essentially fracture with another earthquake. When that happens, the fuel pools drain. A word about fuel pools. They're even more dangerous than reactors. And they're double and triple and quadruple racked. Uh, I visited a, a nuclear community uh, uh, in the Northeast. Uh, the fuel pool is designed for uh, 800 fuel assemblies. It's now holding 3,200. It's quadruple racked. So these pools are extremely threatening and they need to be cooled all the time. And if they're not, if the, if the circulation system uh, fails, then they have the failure of, of the circulation system and they develop um, uh, essentially large quantities of hydrogen and there are explosions. If that happens with Unit 4, what we then have is radiological fire and because the fuel pool is essentially uh, a few meters away from Unit 4, there's a fuel pool there, um, that radiological fire will spread, so it'll be a house of cards, and nobody will be able to work at that site. The other thing you need to know about robots, right? We think, oh, well, robots, robots can do it. Well, what happens is, you see, with our great machines and our great progress, is that radiation kills robots after two hours. So we don't have the technology yet to deal with this. And TEPCO is saying as much. They're saying, well, we'll figure it out. We don't have it right now, but we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll just come up with it. Trust us. Now, I haven't talked to you at all about the uh, role of the Japanese government and the Japanese media. But I can tell you this, that it's absolutely no different from what our situation is here. This book represents nine months of research. People said, oh, you went to Japan. No, I went to my computer. People interviewing me say, oh, well, there's no information available. No, 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 no. There's plenty of information available. At the end of my talk, um, Ruthie is, is going to be handing out uh, uh, a uh, a pass out to you, uh, and on that pass out, you're going to see I've listed some reliable information sites. Not all of them are. Uh, some of them are a little ooga booga and a little mysterious, but the ones I put there are not a whole lot, um, but they are reliable. Uh, equally, on that sheet, you will see that there is a whole program of learn and do, right? So 
there are suggestions about getting active, and I want to talk about that, and then I'm going to end here. Um, but getting active, uh, there are opportunities to volunteer. Um, there is a small bibliography. In the process of doing this research, uh, I have just I have three pages of simply the book bibliography. That doesn't include the articles, but of those books. I've, what I've done here for you, um, because I love you, is I've given you the very best books that I found in the process of doing this. And so they're here. And uh, then I've given you uh, a petition site to go to. And, uh, and in honor of Occupy, because that's what we are, we are a people's movement, I have given you the website for um, Occupy uh, Sandy Relief. They are accepting donations, and guess what? That's who's doing stuff in Staten Island. That's who's doing stuff. Not the Red Cross. Don't ever, ever again give anything to the Red Cross. But here's a place where you can give, and they're doing very substantial work, and Amy Goodman talked about them this morning. So basically, uh, I, I just want to finish by uh, talking about the intersection of the nuclear situation and Occupy, because that's what I came here tonight to do. We need you, the movement needs you. And I, I'm gonna take this, this is my magic sheet out, um, to show you, and then I'll pass it up. Um, now, what this is, is an article from the Good Gray New York Times, My Picture Don't Lie, and it's dated uh, June 30th, 2012. You would think that it would be out of date. Not at all, because this is a picture of what happens every Friday night in Tokyo. People turn out because they're mighty pissed. Their government is not telling them the truth. Their government is refusing to evacuate people. There are already approximately 30,000 children that have not been evacuated that are showing uh, nodes on their thyroids, okay? Doctors are telling their mothers, no, this has nothing to do with radiation. No, 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 no. you're just imagining. He has a cold. So women are desperate. Um, and they're forming their own people's clinics, by the way. And as soon as I get a website for that, I'll try to let you know. But what you're looking at is 200,000 uppity, uppity Japanese people, okay? And Japanese people, if you've had the good fortune to be acquainted with, with them, as a general rule, are respectful. And they are obedient. And this hurts. This hurts tremendously to have to, to confront authority like this. It is extremely difficult. They have overcome their cultural restraints. So here's my pitch. If they can do it, we can do it too. Because guess what? We've got them too. We want to be nice. We want to be loved. And we don't want to get out beyond the certain line in the sand. Okay, we don't want to get uppity and ordinary and offensive, okay? So what the Fukushima? <laughs> All right? <laughs> so thank you very much for um, your kind attention. Maybe I talk too long and try to pass this around. No. I want you to see it. I want you oh to see God. what this looks like. And the picture's wow. been cropped. But it's 200,000 people every Friday night. So dig it. There are, there's literature on the sign in at the front table. Uh, every 11th of the month, um, Fukushima, um, the Fukushima No Nukes Action Committee is staging a demonstration in front of the Japanese consulate. You guys showed up last time, and let me tell you, you added energy, and that's what we need. We need collaboration, because this issue essentially affects everything. It's civil rights, racism, reproductive rights. It's the whole ball of wax Global. in this in this issue, global warming, and warfare as well. So. Um, there are three organizations that I know of, and there may be more here in our area that are doing work. One of them is No Nukes Action. We are a bunch of people, uh, both Gaijin and Japanese, working together. 
and our literature is there for these uh, November 11th um, for the uh, November 11th demonstration. Please join us. We would love for you to be there. Bring signs, okay? What the Fukushima? <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then there is Fukushima response. This is on the pass out. You can hand it out now. Um, on the pass out. Um, there's a very vital chapter working now already in um, Sebastopol. They really have their shit together. They're doing very, very good work. One of the things they're doing that you might want to consider is they had recently a, a man who's an expert, and who's just back from Japan, who's an expert in the use of Geiger counters. So he would be uh, very, uh, I think, available to come and talk to us about taking readings because that's what's going on in the United States. There's a whole circuit of people that are taking Geiger counter readings. That's why I could tell you that right now Philadelphia's hot. Okay, I, and I'm on that circuit, I get that email. So, uh, and then there's a third organization which is doing very important work and I see Don Eichelberger is here. Hello. Hello. Uh, and that's um, Nuclear Free California. And Nuclear Free California has the program of working to shut down our California reactors. Okay, San Onofre nearly had a catastrophic accident and for any, it's very complex, the information is very complex, but anybody who wants the facts, I printed this out and there's another one on the table there. Where is so, where? San Onofre, yeah, it's down near San, San Clemente. San Clemente. Just down the beach from the Right, Michigan. and essentially what they have is in both reactors, units two and three, they have broken, um, they have broken circulation pipes, and uh, and they they were broken because they were subjected to entirely too much vibration, so they fractured. So that 400 of them are broken. Now Southern California Edison is proposing, wouldn't it just uh, guess what? We'll just we'll just we'll just run it for five months and you know see if it works. Uh, and, and, and then we'll shut it down and, and we'll take stock if it worked. <laughs> and this is true. And, and, and what's an issue, my dears, is, is Imperial Valley and, and San Joaquin Valley. That's where uh, food is grown that feeds the United States, feeds us, uh, and feeds the world because food, food products are exported, as you know, from California. And I have to tell you, that uh, this year the, the almond crop is, is uh, contaminated. Mm -hmm. It is showing levels of radiation. By the way, thank you so much for bringing this information in about how to live, how to eat. Uh, on, on the pass out that you have, um, there's also a website which I found is very useful. It, it summarizes what this young woman has circulated here. It's called the Holy Kale. So if you remember the holy kale, you can go to that website and find out how to eat. So are there any questions? Yes. Questions. Yes. Yes. I was wondering, um, you talked a lot about the workers at, at Fukushima. And I'm wondering um, how what's the time frame in which people actually start showing effects or because they're right in the heart of it, are they already um, being affected physically or will it take five to 10 years or a little more about that? Uh, a little more. I can't answer your questions faithfully, uh, but, but there may be people here who can uh, more accurately than I. I will tell you this, that prior to this accident, the uh, annual dosage um, for children was one millisievert a year. Now that may not mean anything, but just think of the number one. And I can tell you now that that has been upped to 20, that's 20 times, 20 millisieverts a year for children. Children are much more susceptible than adults, and girl children are more susceptible than boy children, all right? And 20 millisieverts a year is the, quote, accepted dosage for nuclear plant workers. Every plant worker carries a dosimeter, as you know, I'm sure, and uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the work day, um, they have, uh, they're scanned uh, with a Geiger counter. However, this uh, reporter that I mentioned to you that's in the book, 
and by the way, I hope that some of you will buy the book. Um, he reports that uh, some of these workers were encouraged to put lead on top of, the, uh, of their decimeters so they wouldn't read. And, and he also says that um, the Geier counter was unplugged. All right? So this is telling you. Also, some of these areas are so hot that a worker can go in only for a limited amount of time, let's say, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so. Uh, and, and when they're dosimeter reading, it goes up to a critical level, and I don't know what that is. And Tepo probably won't tell us. But then they have to go. And I will tell you this also, that the latest from TEPCO is what they call their conscripting workers. There are 100,000 people on the TEPCO payroll. And now, every year, they're going to be rotated through Fukushima. All of them, 100,000 people. So this tells you something about the magnitude uh, and the horrific uh, uh, magnitude of, the, of this accident. So I don't know if that satisfies your question. It's a long answer. Yes? Uh, I have two questions. One was about the Oyster Point um, nuclear power plant. Um, and you said that when the water got above seven feet, mm -hmm. uh, that the cooling system or whatever it didn't work. I, I'd like to just understand more mm -hmm. about that. So would I. <laughs> <laughs> Anything you could say. And, and the second is, uh, has Japan turned the other nuclear power plants back on, which I know is uh, being opposed very strongly by the Japanese people. Right. Thank you. Good question. Uh, basically, um, despite the 200,000 people, in fact, before the 200,000 people, he decided that, yes, he's going he's gonna to give Kansai Electric permission to start up two reactors at, at OE. Okay, and they were in fact started up, and that's why 200 people turned down in the streets because there had been people in the streets, but not in that number until then. Now there's back and forth. They're talking about, oh, maybe they're going to yield to pressure and shut down the OE reactors, or maybe not. Or maybe they're going to expand the Japanese nuclear industry, and I didn't even talk about that. This is a, another important recent development, and that is that the United States, when they heard NODA announced that Japan would be free, uh, nuclear free, by the year 2030, and that was announced in mid-September. A week later, Noda reversed his position 180 degrees. Why? Because the United States gifted Japan with a missile warning system, an installation, military installation, and they put pressure on the Japanese government. Why? And this is a very important and very complex piece of it. Because for whatever reasons, there have been tremendous trouble uh, designing and maintaining reprocessing plants. And the United States has let the bowl drop. They backed out. But Japan has at least one and possibly two. I think Rokosho also reprocesses. But Manju is the critical plant. And Manju has had fantastic accidents. In fact, while I was writing this book, uh, a crane tried to lift a fuel assembly uh, into, the, uh, into the reactor, and the, the crane lost its grip on, on the assembly. So the assembly was essentially canted at a degree, and it, and it couldn't drop into the slot where it was supposed to go. And they tried to extricate that thing many times. And that procedure, given what's going on at Manju, is very, very high, very hot fuel there. And given that fact, every time they tried to do this maneuver with a crane to try to right the assembly and drop it in, it's extremely dangerous. And all this is happening in a, in a highly seismic zone. Okay, and that's another piece. The, the cocktail of nuclear energy and, uh, and seismic activity
activity is a deadly cocktail. And that's why we have to shut down San Onofre here in California, and why we have to shut down Diablo, because they are on earthquake faults, okay? So, uh, long answer. Uh, did I cover it all? You asked a second one. What was it? Oh, uh, it was about the moisture point and the seven feet of water. Oh, yes. Uh, um, okay. Uh, essentially, uh, what I understand of this accident, of oh, this potential accident, is that it resembled Fort Calhoun. This summer, the Missouri River uh, overflowed its banks. It flooded. And this is part, of course, of the, another deadly cocktail, which is nuclear and global warming. And what did they do at Fort Calhoun? They put a uh, donut <laughs> around it to hold the water back. The donut was basically a big plastic balloon, and it circled the plant, okay? And people kept watching, and the water was rising, and the water was rising. And it came uh, within six inches of cresting that artificial burn. And just at that point, a truck driver backed a truck into it and popped it. Oh. Yes, oh, is right. So th this is how we hang by a thread. And in New Jersey, it's the same thing. What they were afraid of is that their backup generators would flood. And that was the problem. But they didn't have internal power, nor did they have external power. So it became very clear that that was moot. At the point where the water crested to seven and a half feet, they depended on those generators that were probably mounted on a truck. That's the kind of toothpick technology that is keeping all of us alive. Okay, so did that more or less? It's complex, yes. Um, I've been hearing um, that the pools where the, that um, all the, the nuclear reactors, or many of them, have been taken down for the winter, and the materials moved into the pools um, where they here in the United in States. The United States. Mm -hmm. But that the NRC does not require those pools be cooled. And I thought I heard you say that in Japan they are, but I would they like that clarified. Yes, they require the pools to be cooled for sure, because if they weren't, you know, we'd be out of here, right? Uh, no, they definitely do. Um, essentially, uh, what they don't have for the pools is backup generators. They're not required to. That seems to be the difference. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, again, I can't stress enough that the pools are yet more dangerous than the, than the plants themselves. Yes. My name is Ahmed Salah, I'm from the Egyptian Revolution, and my question here would take us back into, thank you. Uh, it would take us back into the point about depleted uranium. It's about if there is a delivery system of depleted uranium without the need of using it for penetration. The reason for my question is, during a battle that happened about a year ago that lasted for six days near around Tahrir, as protesters were occupying the square and were constantly under attack, uh, several, uh, let's say, uh, uh, forbidden weapons were used, such as VX, Tabon, uh, uh, CR, and of course a huge quantity of CS, but also because afterwards, as uh, some doctors were trying to measure the, uh, the, 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 the aftermath, they have discovered that there is high level of radiation that should come from depleted uranium, although no shells were fired. So my question here is if there is a delivery system that is different, that is only uh, de that only delivers depleted uranium without the need of using it just for tipping, you know, the shells for penetration. Thank you. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> but are we surprised? Probably not. I can I can't answer your question because I don't know enough about the technology. This is the first time I've heard of this and I'm very grateful to you for telling us about this. This is ve a very important piece of it. However, I can tell you that if the technology exists, that Dick Cheney holds a sizable position in the factory that's making it. <laughs> and I will say this, but my speculation is that probably there is a technology that is contained in those CS canisters. That would be my, that would be my guess. 
It's manufactured and, uh, and combined systems in professional Philadelphia. Uh, oh, Philadelphia. <laughs> that they love it. Uh, that, yeah. The, 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 the city of brotherly love, yes, yes. Uh, Philadelphia also was the source of those nice little uh, airplane toys that were put in Afghanistan so the kids would pick them up, the mines, okay? Shaped in little airplanes and little trucks so that the kids would play with them. This is the city of brotherly love, yeah. So it's very interesting to hear that. Um, and I would like to talk to you after, I, I wanna write that down, yeah, yes. And you were talking about the connection between the weapons and the nukes. And I don't know how many people know about uh, what goes on at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Please tell us. And uh, at Vandenberg Air Force Base, they set off missiles. They take the ICBMs out of the Midwest where they're based. They take the crews. They take the missile. They take out the war nuclear warhead, of course. What do you think they put in to make up for the weight? DU. DU. Depleted uranium. They then fired them from Vandenberg, and it goes out to Kwajalein, which is where we dropped the A-bomb and the H-bomb and all that until after destroying that land and those people, uh, we got out of there and went to Nevada, etc. And now they go back there, and they're landing there uh, with these missiles, destroying, of course, the whole balance of power because we're, we're worried about Korea with little missiles, and they're sending these huge ICBMs tearing up the coral and all that, but dispewing this depleted uranium among this population which is already so de devastated by, by the, the uh, depleted uranium, with the depleted uranium, by the radiation from, from time Testing, before. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a gathering, we, some of us went back country there at Vandenberg to where they're doing tests there, trying to expose it, and the uh, Nuclear, Nuclear Age Peace Foundation had a big gathering and they brought in uh, a, from the Marshall Islands, from Kwajalein, Senator, Senator, uh, uh, my 80 year old. Is it uh, huh? Not Wyden. No, he's, he's uh, the, from, from, from Kwajalein, from, uh, oh. he's the Senator uh, Broom, Broom, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, Broom. And uh, he was talking about the fact that they have now evidence of the devastating effect it is having on the people there from these tests. Now this is peacetime, there's no reason to be doing this. The only reason they set those off is to try to show that it's safe for us to set them off and it's devastating to the enemy when it gets there. But that is going on right now in peacetime to a, an ally of ours, friends of ours, and they've, so the war is going on. We think the ice, we say, well, we've never used a nuclear missile. We are using them. We're using it. And it's killing it people with the it's radiation. A new, it's a nuclear war. And by the way, one of the things at, at Lompoc, when they first had this, they have a dairy there. I was there in the prison, and there's a camp. It's right on the Pacific coast in direct line of the currents from Fukushima. Mm -hmm. And they had a dairy there, and they found within this dairy, they have radiation mm -hmm. from the Fukushima. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, guys there drink tons of milk. They get it all free from the from the farm. It also is sold all in the area around there and uh, nobody did anything about it. So thank, thank you, you for raising Father all this. Louis. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. Father Louis has served time. And we should give him a shout out. Thank you. So that's a very important uh, factoid that he shared with us that the ballast is the, the, the weight uh, uh, replacement is depleted uranium. And uh, by the same token, uh, in, in every Boeing 737, uh, the ballast is depleted uranium. So you don't want to be in a plane crash in a 737. Pick your airplane for that purpose more carefully. <laughs> All right, you had your hand up back there, yes. So we've already been exposed to the radiation at this point. What do we do about it? How do we help ourselves and our health and our friends and our family? Um, I don't get paid to say this by this company, just so you know. Um, nano liquid zeolite. Liquid zeolite removes almost all radioactive particles from the body. Okay, and because it's nano, nano means super small, so it's about a thousand times smaller than, say, regular liquid zeolite. 
Basically, the smallness of the particles makes it easier to absorb, and the intraoral spray is about 90% absorption rate in the body versus like a powdered liquid zeolite or a liquid zeolite, which would only have 10 to 50% absorption by the body. So I highly recommend getting nano liquid zeolite, which you can find the liquid zeolite company. And you know, if you want, I can pass this around so you guys can see it. It's a good idea. Yeah, so liquid zeolite, I highly recommend that. And as far as your question was concerned, what's, what's the damage? Um, radioactive iodine 181, which contributes to thyroid cancer. None of this stuff would be a problem if human beings didn't have better health and we weren't already amped up with you know, healthy iodine in and, and our thyroids. But the problem is about 72 to 99% of the population is iodine deficient. And if your thyroid doesn't have enough iodine in it, which most of ours don't, it will take the radioactive iodine and replace it in your thyroid. And that stuff stays. That's why people are coming down with thyroid cancers. But the, um, the danger in, for instance, radioactive iodine, because its half-life is only eight days, that means it decays. Half of it decays within eight days. So the danger of, of radioactive iodine is very shortly after a nuclear accident. So if we have another one in California that goes off, start taking kelp tablets, okay? There was this whole craze about iodine potassium. Yeah, that's great too, but you can also get it naturally okay, so in seaweed. Let me interrupt you for a yeah, minute. Yeah, for sure. There is a website uh, on the pass out that I've given you, uh, which is the Holy Kale, and you'll find a lot of this information there, as well as links to uh, places where you can purchase this, purchase this stuff. So thank you very much. It's a very, very helpful pass out. Yes. I mean, Hiroshima and Nagasaki had a huge effect on the Japanese consciousness. Nobody else had nuclear weapons, real atom bombs dropped on, on densely populated areas. So of all the places, I was, you know, when I heard about this, it's like of all the places for them to have allowed this to happen, they should have known better, and I'm just wondering if you know why it happened there, of all places. Yes, uh, the official story is that TEPCO, and this, uh, this is only part of it, but TEPCO uh, made every effort not to comply with any of the suggestions that the Japanese uh, nuclear regulatory uh, uh, organization uh, mandated. Uh, basically, the plant was very badly maintained, and even people that are pro-nuclear are going to tell you that, that uh, TEPCO fucked up. I think we could safely say uh, that TEPCO fucked up. But that's not the only story. It goes back, way back, and your question is absolutely right on, um, because at the end of World War II, you can imagine the Japanese were extremely traumatized. And by the way, let me tell you, this may not have been the first time that an atom bomb was dropped on a civilian population. There is some evidence that the uh, uh, accident uh, at Port Chicago, which is now the uh, Concord Weapons Depot, may very well have been our government's uh, attempt to use human guinea pigs uh, as an experiment to find out what the effect would be on life, on human life. And of course, in Kwajalein and also uh, and in Port Chicago, we are talking about people of color. So this issue, racism, is wrapped up in this issue as well. Uh, downwinders, by and large, and that's covered in this book as well, there's a lot of background here on downwinders, and they are very, almost, almost always people of color. Australia and England oh, yes. dropped, uh, tested a bunch of bombs in Australia, and the Aborigine people got contaminated. Yes, yes, and uranium mining goes on in Australia. So more background on the Japanese situation. At the end of World War II, the United States identified a war criminal, took him out of jail. Uh, his name is Shohiki. He owned a television station, and they nailed him. And uh, his program was to convince the Japanese, despite their trauma, that nuclear energy was good for them. Mm -hmm. And he succeeded admirably. And that's part of the background, too. Uh, there are articles about that, and there's also a film, How Nuclear Energy Came to Japan. 
Uh, and, and that, by the way, could be shown here if you guys are interested. That film is available. Equally, there's another film uh, called Fukushima Never Again. Very good background information, and a picture is worth a thousand words, and certainly of my words, a thousand words. Other questions? Yes, uh, Cecile, first off, excellent book. Thank you. On page 69, you bring up a point that I'm also reading in Medea Benjamin's book on drone warfare. You bring up a very scary point how Reliant Energy, you say, is one of the current administration's big money funders. Well, with the current administration's reliance on drones, there's now talk of nuclear arming drone missiles and General Atomics down in San Diego has created now the Predator Sea Avenger. It has got an internal weapons bay that can hold up to 3,500 pounds of weapons. How soon, folks, before we see in some of our little shadow wars that the current administration or the next administration, whatever it may be, is fighting where the drones will have nuclear weapons? And finally, we talked about the clean uranium. They're going to start putting weapons, nukes in drones. Yes, thank you. That's a very important piece of it. Yes. 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 And war is profitable. And every every time you read that, you know, the war in Iraq has been a failure. Uh, oh no, it hasn't. It's been an immense success. It has made the one percent richer than Croesus. So don't ever, ever fall for uh, uh, articles that tell you that they were failures. No. They have benefited certain people, and they made them criminally rich. I've been reading Cecile's book for about two or three months, and I read it a page at a time because it's so upsetting to me that I can't. It's so upsetting to me to read her book that I can only read it about a page or two at a time, and then I sit and digest it for a few days and read another page. Um, my question for Cecile is knowing all this about what's going on with our country and with all around the world with nuclear reactors and the lies and deception that's perpetrated upon the people, how do you keep your sanity? <laughs> well, <coughs> confession. I feel the same as you do. And I have a terrific advantage because this was the way I processed it. And to write this, it, it was extremely expensive. It's what I call expensive. So I started with a total car crash. And fortunately, I have a nice little scar here. But fortunately, that's all I have. Um, and I ended with a broken ankle uh, when I turned the manuscript in because it, it, the weight was lifted in a sense. You know how the feeling schools out, schools out. And so I wasn't paying attention. So boom, I went down and I smashed my ankle. So I have this advantage. And I will say this, there is nothing, there is absolutely nothing that answers this question, because it's all of our question. There's nothing that answers the question except engagement. Engagement. That's why I came to be with you tonight. And engagement on two levels. The first one is, and that's what I meant by we're living now in a, in a paradigmatic existentialist shift. It's the same question that people used to ask each other, well, you know, if this were the last day of your life, how would you want to be? Who? Who would you want to be? So the first thing is to love one another, it seems to me. And to try to the best of our ability, even when we're pissed off as hell with one another, to understand that we can love that person, that the, what's pissing us off may be our problem, but in any case, it doesn't really have to do with our, with our privilege, with our invitation to love one another. We can still love the person whom we're really upset about. 
It's hard to imagine loving Dick Cheney. And it's hard to imagine loving some of the others. It really is. But when you start to think about how damaged their uh, psyches must be, uh, then we can perhaps begin to understand that they are as crippled as, as a basket case. Yeah. But they are spiritual basket cases. And we can extend uh, compassion. But the other side of the engagement coin is to turn out, to turn out. It seems to me that we're headed to the brick wall. And you know, when people don't have anything left to lose, they turn out. And we have to understand where we are now politically in this moment. You may think you have something to lose, but every day that you draw a breath in the political atmosphere that exists now, in a political climate that is re-feudalizing the way we live, I don't think you got much left. I really don't. So thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>